Well, it is time for another video with uh, BJB Enterprises, and they were kind enough to let me come hang out with them and ask them some questions. And I came on this visit equipped with some questions I get a lot from uh, many of you in the comment section here on the YouTube, but as well as uh, comments and questions I get through the Facebook and things like that. And Raul here with BJB is kind enough to sit down with us. And one of the things that I get a lot of questions about is UV stability, or I want to make Widget X and put Widget X outside. So, you know, what does that mean? What do I, what kind of steps, what kind of, what do I need to know to do that? And, and that is in our universe of making these mm -hmm. custom parts and whatnot, uh, color stability, UV stability, especially putting things outside, as it were, is, uh, is a big thing. So here to talk about that is Raul. So Raul, um, yeah, yeah, good, good to see you again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I know you guys have a huge spectrum of uh, water clear plastics and uh, a lot of polyurethane formulas that are you know flexible and rigid yep. for a lot of different applications. So if somebody comes to you and is asking, is saying something is they want UV stability, what where does that typically take you? Typically, I'm going to ask what kind of, first of all, um, we, there's two types of plastics that, that are polyurethanes, right? The ones are aliphatic and what, when, uh, some are aromatic. Okay. Uh, aliphatics are formulated to be, their type of formula that they have and the raw ingredients are very UV stable. So if somebody tells me that they're going to be outside, then I'm going to ask, well, is it going to be raw? Is it going to be just a natural? Or are you going to add a little bit of tint? Or are you going to be painting it? Outside doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be in its natural form. Sometimes you're, you can paint something and get away with uh, that. So that's the first thing that I'm going to ask for. Okay. So let's say something you're, you're designing a... Uh a taillight lens or something mm -hmm. like that, that's going to be an automobile application out in the Mojave Desert, uh, some kind of custom car application, and you're looking for a clear, where does that, where does that take me? Yep, that's definitely gonna uh, lead us into our water clear series, which would be aliphatics. Okay. And uh, taillight lens, we have uh, something rigid, something like our 783 is something very popular that, um, it's going to give you the clarity and the ability to add a little bit of tint. Sometimes you can be, it, it'll be translucent or sometimes you can be even be opaque because it's going to live outside and you don't want a painter. It's, you would go to something like, like this. Um, super, th these are, like I said, it's formulated to be outside, UV stable. It's not going to yellow over time. It's going to keep that color stability and still have some really good properties. Um, there are some, when you're using aliphatics, there are some things that you have to take into consideration. Like if you're making a taillight lens, uh, you want that clarity and you're gonna have to process it a certain way. You're gonna have to pull vacuum on it um, and make sure that it stays that clarity because when we start mixing, you're gonna get some micro air bubbles in there that's gonna look like a fizzy soda kind of thing and you don't want that in a taillight lens. You want it to be nice and clear. Um, another thing with aliphatics is, yeah, it's got great uh, clarity, but once you demold it, they don't have great um, heat deflection temperature. You need a little bit of help uh, to do what we call a post cure. You'll put it in an oven. You want to get as close. We here internally see 160 F for 16 hours. You don't have to get, you want to get as close to that as you can, but with something like a taillight lens, it's very thin walled. So if it's going to live outside, it's going to get the sun all day and every day you want to make sure that you help it out by tightening everything up with a little bit of a post cure. And it's, that's just, think of it like tempering glass kind of thing or metal yes. is just tightening everything up. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, so you've got, so you got a part that uh, is going to go outside, but doesn't necessarily have to have the clarity. So we don't necessarily need an aliphatic for the clear properties, but you've got this part that you want to be a specific color, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, bright yellow or something like that. And we've got this part and but we know again it's not clear but we want it to stay that color mm -hmm. and we want to put that outside what uh... so we do have a couple of hybrid options okay okay so the hybrid options are great i love those because they're more they're going to stay clear they have that that uh, aliphatic property to it where they have good clarity and they're going to be great they have great physical properties and you're able to pigment them really well 
something like our 878 slash 879, and the only difference is the work time on there. Where something really big, you're gonna want something like our 878 that has a 15 minute work time and a longer demo time. But something like this, this is like a, a, a fender flare in here. And you feel that nice flex, it's super, I mean, and that started out as a clear. They added, uh, the, the client wanted to make it a yellow fender flare. I recommend that material all the time because you're able to get that color stability on there and uh, great physical properties, great heat deflection temperature. Um, the impact strength on that is, is great. So I would steer them into something like that. Um, it's something that it not necessarily wants to be painted. Got it. So, so this, if we've got an application like say, like a semi rigid or something yeah. like that, where we need a, a specific color and you want that color to be intrinsic, kind of baked into the part, we could use something like, oh, there it is right there, TC878. Yeah. Um, this would be a good candidate for that. And then this is going to stay true to that color over time. So yep. Yep. now is there a, let's say, uh, I'll, I'll be that, that guy. Um, we've got this, this part. What am I looking at lifespan wise? of a part like this. Uh, I know I've seen this part sitting around here for a few years. It's so, been quite a bit but, of year, yeah. But is there a particular thing as far as time, time considerations? I know that's something as well that you have to think about with this is, you know, what, what kind of lifespan are we looking at on parts like this? So just, and I should also point out, we're talking about outside, but for the viewing audience, outside is a very broad term. Outside in Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. versus outside in you know, uh, uh, Newburgh, Oregon, are gonna be very different places. So, uh, so obviously, yeah, that's gonna play into that. Very much so. It's, uh, it's miles may vary. If something is gonna be used all day, every day, outside in the sun, uh, where something that's going to be garaged, this could last 15, 20 years easily. Okay. But yeah, that's one of those things, and I know we used to deal with that a lot uh, with people doing parts like this where it is, there's so much of that that then gets very part specific of how this thing is going to be used, how it's going to be stored and all that, and that, that is, that's the tough thing about outside Correct. stuff. Now, now, for parts like this that are... You, you know, color true parts where you're wanting to make parts that match a specific color, but they don't necessarily need to be uh, out in the sunlight or anything like that. Um, what, how do you guys approach something like that? Say, say customer X comes to you and they're building these tires or, or rubber parts or resin parts or whatever, but they need them to be intrinsically a very specific color. Yeah. So something like our Color Flex series, just like these guys here, um, this is this cures almost like a translucent white kind of okay. thing. It's very it's very easy to pigment. It's got a little bit of it's very it's UV stable. I don't want to say it's a complete like aliphatic true water clear, but it's we found that it's done really it's it does really well in the sun. Um, now some. Um, when you're pigmenting something, a material, obviously the darker the pigment, the more stable it's going to be over time. The lighter, the more uh, the um, UV is going to, to, to affect it. I did not know that. that yeah. Was, uh... So, so with, uh, with a non-UV stable material, they may start off with something like a very clear, this is one of our fresh samples here, right? That's our F105, I believe. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. and it's super clear. And then over time, what happens is, is the material starts oxidizing and it starts darkening up a little bit. So this is a little bit, this is probably maybe a month old, right? So you'll see like the yellow on the side, it's gonna start um, changing colors a little bit. The longer that goes, the darker it's going to get. When you add some pigment to it, it's something like a, like a white to this is going to change and you're gonna notice it a lot more than something like a, like a green. So take that into consideration, and black is always, if you, we always say, if you're able to go black, that's gonna be the best option for you because it's just, uh, it's, it's UV, you're not gonna see that change in color. So, so basically, and this is, this is good information because this is, this is new to me, and I think this has come up before, but now it's registering, is the, so black pigment is actually 
because I would be concerned that this part would yellow and and change color. But what you're saying is like black can actually protect against that of hiding that yeah. that aging. Yeah, it's a pretty much it's a UV inhibitor, right? It's not going to let anything a, a, attack it. And that's so that's a good another good thing to bring up for this audience is the UV additive. I have, I think I've done. I think I've incorporated that in, in some parts in some videos a while back, but tell me about that because I know you guys have a UV additive, and I know that's one of those tricky things that yeah. you can't just dump UV stuff into anything and it turn it magic. So. Right, right. The UV, um, we do have, so going back to our water clears, we have, uh, if we get a project that we know that the that part is going to live outside, we want to give it a little bit of an extra protection on, on that. And there is an extra UV protection package that we that we put in some of our systems. Um, the natural, what we call the natural water clears, they will, if they're going to live outside, over time, you're going to see a very slight difference into uh, changing that clarity. We wanted to make sure that something like an, we have a lot of artists that come and, and have like mass uh, cast projects, projects, excuse me, then uh, they want to make sure that that's a legacy uh, piece that they're going to live for as long as they, they live and, and, and for, <laughs> longer than that. So we'll add a little bit of our UV inhibitor in there to keep give it that extra stability and peace of mind. Um, for our aromatics, the non-UV stable materials, we have also a UV uh, additive that goes in there, but that's more to protect the physical properties of it, not so much to change the, what happens in the oxidation process. So a lot, we get a lot of that question when you see the UV 100 and they want to go, it's like, well, why do I need to go to the aliphatic, the UV stable material? If you guys already have the UV 100, I could just you know, add, add it to one of these things. We have to just let them know. It's, it, that's more for physical properties. The degradation under the sun on something like this is gonna slow down. It's not the cure-all. It's still plastic that's gonna be out in the sun, but it slows it down a little bit. The physical property uh, uh, changes. Excellent, let me take a look at that. That's... And that's a really good, um, uh, example of what oxidation does you'll see it kind of on the outside towards the middle start it, it's a little bit more it's a little clearer and you guys did uh, a good example of that i've seen some pictures around your your showroom of that water tank yeah in clear and that is how old now how that was i believe that's 1998 right, around oh, that wow. that's okay. close to 27 28 years okay um and that was that was interesting. I wasn't around uh, uh, while well, I was working at BJB with, but the story it goes is they took the mold and they brushed in a UV, a one of our water clears that has that extra UV package, and then poured the back fill with one of them that, that didn't have. That's a little bit. It's they had a longer work time. It just for in a mass cast setting, at that time that product was more fitting. A clear coat is a great option for sometimes when you have a master that you that you make into a clear, you make a mold and you're pulling out a clear, sometimes that master doesn't have the great surface quality that you're looking for to give it that clarity and that depth. When you put a clear over it, that actually enhances that that glossiness in there and it gives you protection. There's two part uh, clear coats that really do a good job in helping protect either the surface and the, the clarity of it. Excellent. Well, and on all this stuff, because I realize we've kind of skimmed over, yeah. there's a lot There's a lot to digest here. But for those watching this, I, again, this is one of those things that I used to get a lot of questions about. Hey, I'm making widget X, and it's this color, and I want to make absolute sure that it stays this color. Um, I think one of the important things is this is like a, each each situation requires its own it needs to be attacked separately. There's not a there's not one magic thing that's going to do all that. We want to think, okay, if we need clarity, we get something with clarity that can handle that. If we're doing something rubber, we need something that is appropriate for that. Um, and then to use the old magician adage, don't run if you're not being chased. If yeah. This is going to be a part that's inside. There's no reason to do all the do all the stuff to it for you know something that's going to be sitting on a desktop. But Last but not least, and I, I may, you may hate me for this later, but uh, those that are shopping out this kind of stuff and, and trying to, to figure out specific 
stuff for a particular project, um, you are available to discuss this sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, okay, because this is this is one of those things where it really helps, and I use this all the time of uh, just being able to call up BJB and say, "Hey, I'm about to make this particular widget, and that I need to be this way, and." It needs to meet these parameters, or this is how it's going to be used. And you guys know the right questions to ask because y'all are asked y'all ask me stuff that I never would have even thought about, and then help pick out a material. And then, last but not least, and I apologize, I'm, I'm this is one of those things that kind of my pet peeve on this is really important when you're doing all of this stuff before you make any molds, any kind of tooling. Call Raul and make sure that all this stuff is going to be compatible. Because yes. that is one of the most profound moments of sadness you can have as <laughs> yeah, I've done that. Is Been there. you make a beautiful mold, you get all your tooling in order, everything's great, and then you pick a, a particular casting material that has uh, an issue with that mold material. And that, that stuff happens, that there are so many different molding and casting materials that can easily happen. So always a good idea to start with the, uh, the end result that you're going to do and then work backwards from that point. Absolutely, give us a call. We take those calls all the time and just get ready to answer a lot of questions because we want to make sure that we're gonna lead you in the right direction and make it as easy as fun and fun as possible. Excellent. Well, Raul, thanks for joining yeah. me here. I appreciate your input on this. And as always, I'll link to some other videos on the end screen. In fact, you reminded me of the uh, the end of the video that I have about post curing. So I'm going to link that on the end screen about post curing resin for the better physical properties and some of the other videos I've got about uh, pigmenting material. And of course, Raul, uh, he may hate me for this later, but those of you that have <laughs> questions about material selection. Roll's an excellent guy to talk to on that. This is one of the things that real important in this universe if you're doing any kind of professional casting, having somebody that you can talk to and bounce this stuff off before you get started making your tooling or your part is uh, there's you really can't put a price on that. So again, Roll, thanks a lot. And I'll put links to uh, some of the stuff we talked about here. I'll put a link to your website in the video description. And again, don't neglect the end screen, some really good material there as well. So Roll, thanks a lot. And thanks to all of you for watching. And of course, as always, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe, comment for the algorithm, and thanks for watching and supporting the channel.